Hey everybody, welcome to the Portsmouth School Department School Committee meeting of Tuesday, June 23rd. Um, would you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence for our troops in harm's way. And the flag is in Dr. Kenworthy's screen. I pledge allegiance mm -hmm. to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, uh, we had a, an executive uh, session prior to this meeting. Uh, we recessed that executive session and we will uh, be rejoining that after the conclusion of the public session. Um, but I would like a motion to seal the executive session minutes from June 9th, 2020. Mm -hmm. we're, we're making sure that we always, um, since we can't come back into public after our executive sessions, we're always making sure that we um, do this at the, the public meeting. So moved. Second. Okay, first uh, and second by Mr. Ferber and Mr. Shears. Uh, and I'll do a roll call vote, please. Uh, Mr. Ferber? Aye. Mr. Piero? Aye. Ms. McDade? Aye. Mr. Shears? Aye. Mr. Vadney? Aye. Emily Copeland? Aye. Please let the record reflect that uh, Ms. Holtman is not with us tonight, so the vote was 6-0 and one absent, I guess. Yeah, we we'll need to do that. Um, okay, so uh, on to chairperson's remarks. Uh, roll call. Uh, please let the record reflect for our public meeting that uh, Ms. Holtman's not with us tonight. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is the update on the town budget hearing and approval. Um, we had uh, on June 10th, uh, the public uh, hearing on the town budget, uh, operational and capital. Um, at that hearing, uh, the town reduced our capital request by 221,875, um, leaving us with a capital budget of 200,000 uh, for next year. Um, that meant that the total reductions to our capital and operating budget from what we submitted to the town was 458,000. Um, last night at the town council meeting, they voted to unanimously um, approve uh, the FY21 budget. Um, and so tonight, uh, later on the agenda, we will be uh, adjusting our budget, uh, which Superintendent Kenworthy here will present under business, uh, to reflect um, those cuts, okay? But the budget is approved for uh, next year. Um, item C is district subcommittee uh, appointments. Um, we have, uh, or Dr. Kenworthy has established um, several new subcommittees to, uh, to uh, provide input on the uh, reopening and um, racial equity. So I'd like to appoint uh, for the reopening steering committee, Ms. Kate Holtman, for the reopening uh, committee on instruction and support, Ms. Karen McDade, for the reopening uh, committee on health and safety, uh, Mr. Alan Shears, and for the Racial Equity Subcommittee, Mr. Uh, Carlos Payera. And thank you all for agreeing to uh, do this. I know that mm -hmm. usually this time of year, this is our last meeting uh, before we take a little break over the summer, but that's not going to happen this year. And I think there's going to be a lot of, lot of discussions over the month of July. So um, thank you all for agreeing to serve. Oh, and I just wanted to mention, um, I need to find a way to get the Rhode Island 2020 Kids Count um, book to maybe Mr. Payero and Ms. McDonald, because <sighs> that, that's reflected in your committee work. You might want to take a look at that. So send me an email and we'll, we'll figure that out. Okay, um, and then finally, 
Um, this is also, since it's the last meeting, kind of in June, uh, at the end of the school year, this is also when the um, uh, school committee sets uh, or starts to think about, obviously, uh, next year. And we usually have a workshop sometime in August, so I'm kind of talking to the committee members here. Uh, obviously, Amanda will be um, sending out some scheduling, but to try and make her job a little easier. Um, I'm just curious, is there, like if we think of August as week one, week two, week three, week four, um, let me make sure there's four, week, four months, four weeks in August. Uh, yeah, there's four full weeks, okay? Uh, the week of the August 2nd, the week of August 9th, the week of August 16th, and the week of August 23rd. Is there any of those weeks where school committee members would not be available? I know August. everybody's planning vacations this year, right? Alex? August 23rd week. August 23rd, no, okay. Same Anybody for else? me, same for me, uh, August 23rd is a bad week. Mr. Vadney, Carlos, Mr. Ferber, any? Uh, the week of the 17th would be, so that, that's where we're going away. 17th, okay. All right, thank you very much. We will um, we'll work with those dates. Okay, um, that's it for the chairperson's remarks. Uh, on to the subcommittee update policy. Uh, since Ms. Holtman's not here, Ms. McDade? Um, we met, uh, my goodness, when was it? Last week to review the um, graduation policy, um, which you'll see later in the agenda. And um, the, the team that's been working on that was able to resolve a lot of the issues that we had before. So you'll find that in the backup material. Okay, that'll be under business here. So. Good, um, superintendent, moving on to our favorite part, recognitions. Recognitions, yes indeed. Uh, so we have a couple of recognitions this evening and the first is, um, something we don't typically do for this, uh, these awards where we have the Educator of the Year Awards, at least we haven't since I've been in the district, but this was a year that we um, really felt like this was warranted. So tonight, um, I'm, I'm happy to present to you for official recognition um, for our uh, 2020 Council 94 Support Professional of the Year Award. Um, can we base, just like with our Teacher of the Year um, Award, we base these off of nominations. So, as I started going through the nomination, I, I saw a couple um, in, in this area and I just thought it was a great idea. And um, you know, then we had a surprise announcement for our entire district custodial maintenance staff. And you've heard me mention um, many times over the past few months uh, that these individuals have truly been on the front lines for us of uh, everything with uh, COVID-19 and school closure. And um, I know, uh, you know, even uh, in a few examples, I, I've gotten uh, questions on, on, you know, what exactly are the uh, custodians doing sometimes even during school closure. I mean, I, I can tell you that um, just ev ev every time that we have to let people into the, have had to let people into the building for any reason over the past few months. Um, so certainly they were, they were doing an enormous amount of, you know, deep cleaning and sanitizing in the beginning stages of this, but uh, just in the past few months throughout school closure, we've had opportunities for students that we've had to create to get items, teachers, uh, obviously, uh, and then uh, it was en end of the year activities between graduation and uh, dropping off um, of uh, various items. Again, every one of those uh, opportunities where people come into the building, it just requires this enhanced, uh, you know, cleaning pro protocol. And we do know too, we're gonna, we're gonna talk a lot later uh, in the agenda about our uh, reopening plans and what our current thinking is. I mean, again, this is a group of people, um, you know, as I presented the award, uh, you know, I, I did indicate uh, that they're, they're gonna be working above and beyond again uh, as we get ready for school reopening and, and, and what that may, may bring us in the fall. So um, if, if I could uh, just read through the list of our uh, custodial maintenance staff. So from Portsmouth High School, uh, we have Mr. Michael Bidlack, Anthony D'Alessandro, Paul, Paul Fisher, Bob Ibbotson, Todd Powell, James Weaver, and Ryan Williams, and uh, that's Portsmouth High School, sorry. 
Courts of Middle School, uh, Bob Carberry, Don Lauder, Nelson Quintanilla, Ryan Randall, and Jose Ribello. Hathaway Elementary School, Mel Benilla and Manuel Ferreira. At Melville, Nick Pacheco and John Souza. And then our district maintenance staff um, who, who pitches in you know, all over the place for us, Doug Broder, Ed Lima, and Bob Singleton. So again, congratulations and thank you to all of those individuals. I think, I think oh, that's sorry. really, really well deserved and uh, I, you know, so great, great, great choice. So our other recognition this evening is this will be our last uh, official uh, school committee meeting, obviously, as we indicated before the end of the school year. So um, as you know, Kathy Sapala has been with us for the past six months or so as our interim assistant superintendent. Um, you know, I, we, we've done a few, uh, we've had a few opportunities to recognize Kathy now within um, the uh, district leadership team and then our um, administration building staff. And, and you know, I just, I, I, I can't help but remember when I, you know, all, all signs were pointing to uh, former Superintendent Riley getting ready to take her new position. And I, I figured again, wanting, wanting to step into this role, I better have uh, my ducks lined up, so to speak. Uh, for my conversation with the school committee. And uh, you know, one of those uh, items at the top of my list was, was being able to, to just pick a, you know, an interim superintendent who I knew I could, I could trust and who could you know, really bring in and, and, and add value uh, to our district. And you know, I, I can't but remember, Kathy and I had a, a conversation over coffee one morning in December. And, and you know, I remember us talking, yeah, you know, she had, uh, you know, a lot of uh, responsibilities she had assumed in retirement with, with her family. And, you know, we had talked about, you know, maybe three days a week uh, would be plenty to just kind of, you know, keep the operations running. And then uh, we all know what happened uh, as of March 13th. So I think it was definitely more than she bargained for, but we, we can't thank her enough. Uh, it's been, you know, equally tremendous just having her, you know, this, this past month or so, the transition with Mrs. Viveros coming into the role again, uh, that, that couldn't have worked out better for us. I know she's, uh, she's been doing a lot with that transition there. So thank you, Kathy. You are very welcome. Um, it has been a pleasure, I'm gonna say that. Yes, I came in with a lot of conditions and the conditions were Zachary Elliott, Gabriel, Nathaniel, and Luke. And then all heck broke loose. So um, I, my time got freed up because my families were in, uh, in um, close quarters too. But this was, I'm gonna say, equally good for me to give 41 years of your life to the profession. You don't just give it up. And I've been um, doing part-time things that very, very minimal. And this was fabulous to meet your school department, to meet the good people that are working and to say, I can do this. You know, I, I, I can do this if, if needed. And I have thoroughly enjoyed it. You've got a great team. I set it up from the beginning. I came because I knew Tom was a good leader. And I was, I'm, I've always supported the young leadership in RISA. And I've met them all in your school department. It's been a pleasure. I'm not finished. Like I'm staying through because this policy is something I worked on. And um, your, your opening plans I've supported. And I've got a few other things to do. So you'll see me a couple days. Um, I'm sure I'll be done. Liz is ready. She was ready before and she's even more ready now. We've done our transition. So you're in great shape. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just have to say it was also from a, uh, even though, you know, we didn't work on a day to day basis, it was really um, uh, insightful and helpful, I think, for us to hear your views on some of the teaching and learning that's been going on and the presentations. And, you know, those those visuals really showed up our former assistant superintendent with some of those. So, um, <laughs> Absolutely. She uh, <laughs> set the bar high for our incoming super assistant superintendent. Yeah. So thank you so much from all thank of you. us for all the all the care and the work you've done. Really thank appreciate you. it. You're, well, you're very welcome. Um, uh, Steve, is there any public comment? Uh, hold on. Let's see. Nothing in the chat, and no hands are raised. Nobody's waving arms. Anything? No waving arms that I can see. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Yep. Um, Dr. Kenworthy, superintendent's update. Thank you, Dr. Copeland. Uh, so uh, first up, um, I, I just like to 
to provide a personnel update to uh, let the committee and the public know of uh, any comings and goings with our staff since the uh, last school committee meeting. So uh, we, since the last meeting, we're, we're turning our attention to, uh, although we have a lot to figure out with reopening, um, we do have a number of open positions that we've put on hold right now in the hiring process, again, to wait and see how uh, things kind of uh, flesh out for us. But we've done a careful analysis and uh, obviously there are positions we know we're going to need. So we have, we've started that, that process. Um, so I am able to announce tonight uh, two uh, hirings that I've finalized. Um, so at Melville Elementary School, uh, a, a special education intensive teacher, Bridget Fleming, and also at Melville, uh, 0.5 speech pathologist, uh, Amy Hart. So Bridget and Amy were actually both with us last year. They were in uh, one year only positions. So by the nature with those positions, they, uh, you know, they, they, they had come open late during the summer, they become one year only. Um, and then, you know, the person who steps into those positions knows that uh, they have to go through the job assignment process, and because uh, nobody took them, um, Bridget and Amy were then able to apply for them uh, when they when we were able to officially post. So again, they come with uh, stellar recommendations. Um, we're happy to have them on board now in a, in a full capacity. Uh, I will be announcing, I will save it for later in the agenda, but I do have a candidate to bring forward to you this evening uh, to announce uh, from Melville Principal. Uh, and just lastly, we did have a resignation of a, a longtime district employee, uh, so I just wanted to recognize and, and wish her well, Jody Clark, who's been in the district for a number of years. Um, most recently, she had uh, stepped in, stepped away from us temporarily in a fellowship position at RIDE. Um, uh, and, but Jody did just let us know um, uh, since the last meeting that she accepted a uh, position in the North Kingstown School District it's gonna be at more of an administrative level with uh, being able to use some of her curriculum um, knowledge that she's gained in, in her work through the years. So we wish her the, the best of luck. Okay. Uh, next up under uh, my updates, I just had uh, to officially acknowledge, um, you know, as we would at, at any, any, any point here, um, the official close of the school year happened on uh, June 18th. Um, you know, again, in any given year, we would want to thank everyone, uh, you know, from staff to students and families, you know, for uh, making uh, their best efforts on a great school year. Uh, obviously, with what we've been going through the past few months um, in, in, you know, just new uncharted territory for everyone and, and you know, what that has meant um, across the board for all efforts. Again, we, we just cannot thank everyone enough. But uh, you know, I think all in all, we, we, we had a, a you know, smooth ending to the school year. Each school, uh, you know, we had the graduation update at the last meeting, but then since then, as we've closed out the school year, I think each school was able to, you know, honor and recognize students and families in the, the most, you know, appropriate socially distanced manner. So um, again, we can't, can't thank everyone enough. Um, you, you know, we have a number of military families in our population. So in, in, in any given year, that means we, we have people who will be you know, leaving us over the summer. Um, and we certainly wish them the best as we move forward. And then we turn our attention, of course, uh, now throughout the rest of the summer to our reopening plans for uh, the 2020-21 school year. So today, actually, we were able to have the first official meeting. Um, you know, we've been been talking a lot about ideas for our plans, um, but we needed to wait. The official guidance from RIDE came out uh, last Friday, RIDE in conjunction with the Rhode Island Department of Health. Uh, so we purposefully wanted to schedule our first official meeting of, of what we've brought together for our steering committee until after then. So we had that meeting today. We have 21 members of that steering committee um, representing again every, uh, you know, uh, stakeholder demographic. Uh, I, I think it's a great committee. As Dr. Copeland mentioned, uh, Ms. Holtman is, is going to serve as the school committee representative. Um, and there's going to be a lot of other opportunity for individuals to get involved. So building the steering committee is going to be just that. It's going to guide our reopening planning efforts. Uh, but in addition to that, we're going to have school-based teams that are already in place at each of our schools. And then um, the majority of the work is, is really going to happen through three main subcommittees. So those are gonna pull from membership of either the steering committee or the 
school-based committees. Um, but those subcommittees will help put together our plan, which is due to ride by July 17th. So, um, you know, it was about a month turnaround time from when we got received the official guidance. Uh, you know, we think we will certainly, um, you know, be ready to submit our plan and put uh, the best, uh, um, you know, plan for the district forward. Uh, what I'm going to start doing as part of, uh, you know, this overall planning process, um, just so everyone is aware, uh, I'm going to send out a weekly communication going forward just on our reopening planning efforts. Uh, and that will happen on Thursdays. Um, we'll, I'll, I'll send that to, you know, the in, entire district community, including staff and families. And uh, I'll start that this Thursday. This Thursday will just be kind of an overview of the process and, and I'll, I'll list those um, steering committee members so everyone is aware of, of who they are. But, um, you know, certainly by the next time that we're back officially um, at a school committee meeting in August, our plan will have been submitted and we will have received feedback from RIDE and, uh, you know, our, our full reopening efforts uh, will, at the school level will be underway. Um, Dr. Kenworthy? Yes. Uh, Mr. Perver, you had a comment I, you want to make yeah, on that? I, just had a um, I, read the re I read the reopening plan, and mm -hmm. the, um, the first thing that occurred to me is it looks like a very expensive plan. And so I wonder if there's any realization right now as to what amount of additional funds will be provided from the state because it strikes me that no community in Rhode Island has the resources to comply with that plan. No, absolutely. You know, we're certainly going to be, you know, what we're anticipating to be additional costs, um, just, just being able to adhere to the transportation guidelines, um, obviously enhanced cleaning protocols, uh, PPE supplies that, that we'll need. You know, this is the point now where we have to kind of actualize and put all of that into effect. The only thing that we know for sure, Mr. Ferber, is um, there is a portion of CARES Act money that's, that's coming you know, through the state for education that they're going to open up for school districts. Now, we did a few weeks ago, um, I would have told you, yep, yeah, we received our notice, we know what that's going to be, but um, if you've received any updates on uh, the state budget process, uh, they did there's gonna be a, a new allocation of that money coming to the state. So the original allocation, which is about $43 million for the state that they were get, then gonna, for education, that they were then gonna divide up uh, to districts, uh, they used to, as part of the, uh, uh, you know, their mechanisms to uh, plug the gap for this current fiscal year. Mm -hmm. I'm being told is they did that only once they knew we were gonna to get to this additional of money, which is supposed to be a little bit more. And again, they're going to put the, that process and that formula in place to start. Um, you know, that it's going to take place through our, um, our federal grant application process that we do with the state. So again, that, that, that'll have to be used specifically for COVID related expenses. Uh, as you indicated, we think we'll have plenty of things that will qualify. Uh, we'll have to officially write for that as we do for any of our federal grants. Yeah. Um, on that, that's all that I know. Wait, 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 wait one sec. Mr. Shears? Yeah. I was, uh, I've been listening, uh, as a, probably most people, uh, to the one o'clock uh, times that the governor is on TV. And uh, with the plan, I was wondering if there's been any more definitive uh, description on. Uh, uh, the uh, sizing of the rooms and the, the distances uh, because I, I have heard and I've tried to listen very attentively where whether it's six feet apart, whether it's 14 feet apart, whether it's only 14 feet apart on groups. Do you have, uh, Dr. Kenworthy, have you gotten any more specific information or really who's on first base and mm -hmm. You know, and, and where we go, because I know I've been hearing, you know, we're going to do this, it's going to work out. I'm just wondering how, uh, if there have been any really instructions to this point, have uh, hopefully you've gotten them for us to work on. Otherwise, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit confused at this time. Yeah, I, I think there is still, you know, cert, there are still certain some things to figure out there, but the, there, is a dish, there is information in that most recent guidance that came out on Friday. 
Okay. I think it's very much, you know, it's going to, it's going to differ a little bit by setting. So in a, in a classroom setting, um, uh, you know, and, and depending by age level, um, you, you know, we, we need to try to spread the students out as much as possible. Um, you know, the, a lot of the language speaks to pod sizes. Uh, so at the, at the elementary and lower middle school grades, um, that, that's basically a group with, they're, they're considering a group of 30 to include any, any of the students, obviously, but also, um, you know, teachers or support staff and to try as much as possible to have that pod, you know, that same group of students and adults uh, be, to, be together uh, th throughout the day. That's obviously a little bit easier to do at the lower grades. So once you once you get into the upper middle school and, and high school grades, um, you know, again the, the the requirements lessen a little bit. Uh, but with anything, mask wearing obviously mitigates um, you, you know things a little bit. Uh, and then you know some of the more challenging settings would be uh, for phys ed or um, you know things like band where we would typically be being, bringing together larger groups of students so we're going to have to really do a, a careful analysis there and see what we can make work okay thank you yep. mr ferber yeah having read that plan um another thing that strikes me is that somewhere in that plan i forget the terminology that was used they encouraged the construction of um i don't want to say booths but there would be um like um uh, i just can't think of the term so especially for the high school students, they'd, they'd segregate each of the high school students in separate units with plastic shields. Uh, and and that, that all strikes me as expensive. So the key point I want to make is there must be a way to do this uniformly through the state. I mean, that the state should, should purchase. If we, if we require these materials, the state should be the, the one to purchase the materials. So unlike the mask situation federally, we're not bidding against ourselves. Among the right. communities, and yep. you know, it, it wasn't clear to me from the plan that that's an intention, but it just strikes me as an obvious thing to do. The masks, for example, if we need, to, I mean, one thing I wouldn't want to see happen is you buy millions of masks and the virus ends. Where do the masks go? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and they have a they have a termination uh, date too, as I understand it. So I mean, some of this stuff just seems, you know, really um, yet to be determined. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, there, go ahead. Sorry, there's definitely a discussion about um, putting together, a, a, you know, as much as possible statewide purchases for school districts. Um, for those items. I mean, up until now, we we haven't, you know, school districts haven't been able to purchase PPE. They've they've really designated that for, you know, medical, medical and in and, and other areas. I mean, we've been able to purchase you know some supplies and things as we needed for custodians, but. Um, Again, now that we have this guidance and we need to start putting our plan together, we'll have a better idea of exactly what we'll need, and uh, definitely we'll need to take advantage of, of you know, some of those statewide. I guess my message is, if they're thinking of leaving each district to itself to make the purchases, I think that's that's wrong. I mean, the yep. map, I, I, I'm not sure. There's perhaps 150,000 students in Rhode Island. If each one of those students has to wear a new mask every day at whatever the cost is right now, I'm sure it's more than three or four dollars a piece uh, because of all of, all of the uh, competitive bidding up of those things. Um, that's a huge expense. That alone, never mind all the other recommendations. The buses, you know, they recommend uh, one student per seat unless it's, a fa unless it's the, other, the other person or the family member. How many buses do we have to run to get the kids to school? You know, I mean, things like that. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, I would just say, I mean, you know, I think the school committee recognizes that, you know, our job is to set policy and it's your job, thank you very much, to, to figure out how to, how to run the schools during, during this very, very challenging time. However, I would hope and I, I think the school committee would agree with me or concur that in whatever version we end up in, you know, whichever one of these three stages that they're talking about, that Portsmouth doesn't just do the minimal, that we don't just you know, meet the requirements. I mean, I think we need um, to, to have as our goal to get the most students back safely in schools for the longest period possible. So that if, you know, if we could you know, like get by with A, we're really gonna try and do B. You know, we, we, wanna, we don't wanna just do the, I would hope that we just don't do the minimal. 
And I, I know that you and the administrative team and the staff are gonna come up with incredible plans and creative ways to overcome some of these uh, COVID obstacles that Mr. Ferber and Mr. Shears um, I mentioned that we're facing. But, but I also really wanna encourage us to think outside the box because you know this, this new reality doesn't have to go back to the same reality, right? I mean, we could create new outdoor classrooms or maybe we put picnic tables outside or, or you know, we, we come up with even better ways to enable kids um, to go back to school. So when I think of all the creativity that went into graduation, I know we have the talent uh, to really tackle this problem. And I, I would just say, don't forget to think about how parents and students can contribute. You know, I hope we, we survey parents and, you know, whether that's the transportation issue Mr. Ferber was alluding to or, or you know, who knows, maybe it's tents or whatever, but um, I think there's a lot of community we could really engage in this process in, in supporting the schools. So obviously, first and foremost, it's safety, um, but I would just hope that within those confines, we go above and beyond um, you know, whatever this new normal is, and we, we basically elevate education in Portsmouth um, in the process. We don't just kind of get by. So anyway, that would be like my challenge to your team. Um, but it's a pretty tall order, I get that. My, my question would be on the subcommittees. So the subcommittees will come up with various avenues, various uh, recommendations to the steering committee and then the steering committee overall would then decipher through that and come up with a with with the plans is that correct uh, doc, Dr. Kendall? Yeah Mr. Chair so we're anticipating that you know there's gonna be a lot of writing and and you know uh, synthesizing of ideas so we're anticipating that that the majority of that work will take place through the subcommittees um, uh, so right now we're going we're 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 just making sure we have uh, all the members we can think of. We'll look to see if, if there are other people we need to reach out to for the subcommittees. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, the, we have the steering committee in place to just kind of have, have check-ins throughout the process. And then each building also has already identified their own building-based team. So they're gonna be ready once we have our plan in place. Uh, obviously now, now that has to be kind of actualized, right, at each, each of the building. Right? buildings individually. So we'll have those teams in place ready to do that. Right. And, and I think a member of our, our audience here, Rose, you just said it's really an opportunity to reimagine education. So lots of challenges, but lots of opportunities too. So. Right. Sorry, I'll get off my soapbox. Okay. Next. No. Uh, <laughs> there'll be uh, plenty of opportunities to uh, provide further feedback. Um, so last item I had under my update was just uh, an update on uh, our five-year capital plan. As you know, we've been having a lot of discussions. Uh, we did have to withdraw our application for our, our bigger, um, uh, you know, $60 uh, million dollar, uh, uh, project. Uh, and, and as far as I know, we're still waiting on the uh, final approval there for what, what we need at, at the Melville property. So that was definitely a, a good move that we made. But um, Mr. Diora and I did meet recently with uh, Mr. Dean and uh, uh, our uh, partners from Studio Jade uh, to kind of pull together from that priority maintenance list that we knew existed at each of our buildings um, and, and talk about what maybe a, a smaller um, you know, capital plan would look like to submit for ride approval so that we can uh, you know, we, we can start addressing some of the, the health and safety needs and still be able to get the reimbursement rate uh, from RIDE. Uh, so I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Mr. Diora. Uh, yes, our initial um, plan was in that about a $12 million range. Uh, we've asked Studio Jade to go back and uh, refine that a little bit more. Once we feel comfortable with that, uh, our next step would be to take it to the Facilities Capital Subcommittee uh, and then go to meet with Ride and uh, do a submission uh, for our smaller five-year capital plan. Is there a deadline? Uh, there are two uh, timelines. We've landed on the timeline of 
a February submission for a May approval. Um, our goal is to put together a plan that can be financed without a bond uh, with the hope that um, once we get through um, the current COVID situation, we could revisit a larger school renovation and addition plan and, and use the bond for that. But we don't want to lose steam and we know there are a lot of um, uh, warm, safe and dry projects that should be and can continue. Okay. No comments. Sorry. Right. Thank you. Um, can I have a motion to approve the school committee minutes of May 19th, 2020? Second. All right. Uh, roll call vote, please. Mr. Ferber? Aye. Mr. Payero? Aye. Ms. McDade? Aye. Mr. Shears? Aye. Mr. Vadney? Aye. Emily Copeland? Aye. Unanimous 6-0, please. Um, this is not a, um, we don't have to act on this. This is our first item for business is a uh, discussion. Um, but I think we need a motion to discuss. I move a discussion on AG Innovation at Portsmouth Middle School. Second. All right. Dr. Kenworthy. All right. So, uh, have, uh, she, she wears many hats in this community uh, as a parent, a very active community member, uh, but also uh, she is also a uh, Portsmouth uh, staff member now. Uh, and it's Ms. Margie Brennan. So she had put uh, a request to uh, update the, the committee and, and the public on some of the great work that's taking place uh, at Portsmouth Middle School through some um, grants and, and other work that she's been able to bring together. So Margie. I think is on there I'm somewhere. Here. Okay, is there anyone else that needs to be unmuted with you, Margie? I'm not quite sure if Sarah Churgan is uh, present, uh, but she is, um, if she is, she's here in, in spirit, I'm gonna okay. present. Okay, uh, so Mr. Costa, we have that presentation, correct? Yep, it is coming up now. So hi everybody, uh, Margie Brennan, science coach, K-8. Um, as you know, I like to do big things. And um, I wanna tell you a little bit about what has been going on as far as remote learning. And Emily, when you were talking about, you know, thinking outside of the box, I, I think Liz right away, um, I, I definitely think this might be something that we can do that can help um, reopening. So um, I'm introducing uh, Portsmouth Ag Innovation Farm. Ag is in agriculture. I partnered up with Sarah Churgan, who worked with Liz Baveros at the Melville School, making the outdoor um, space. Um, she wears many hats, and she's an amazing partner in this project. Um, so next slide, Steve, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. We have a vision. And um, I'm just gonna read it if you don't mind. So our vision is to have the Portsmouth Middle School partner with ERIC, which is the Eastern Rhode Island Conservation Division, to create a place for students to become knowledgeable, compassionate, and innovative thinkers in the realm of sustainable agriculture. Starting with a two acre parcel of land, one half a mile from the middle school, our hope is to create a space to foster environmental awareness and promote students' understanding of nutrition and food access through applied learning. A school garden will serve as a platform for applied learning of STEAM concepts through K-12 teacher and student engagement in experimental standards-based learning in the garden and classroom, learning will be maximized. Next slide. So it began back in February. Sarah Churgan reached out to me and, and was talking to me about um, doing something with Mr. Arruda and the Portsmouth Middle School. And he is a fierce advocate in this project. Uh, so we started talking and Martin Beck, who owns the, the Cloverbud Ranch, had just reached out to her to ask her to meet with him about six acres of land down the road from the middle school and long story short he gifted us the six acres for a five-year stint um, for free um, in hopes that we will do something amazing with it he has he come from teachers so he is also very passionate next slide 
So just to show you, it's kind of a tough um, layout, but that's the big parcel of land. It, it abuts Cloverbud, which is 20 acres behind Sisson Pond. There's a little farmer stand on Jepson Road near the power lines. If you go down there, you can pull in and you can um, take a look. I encourage you and I also ask you to um, call me and I will meet you down there to show you in person. Next slide. So literally the week before the um, shutdown, I started going to the fifth and the seventh grade and I was introducing an after school club called um, Ag Innovation. And when everything shut down, Mr. Arruda and I spoke and we decided to go remote virtual after school club. And I got 25 very excited and enthusiastic students who stayed with me the entire time. Next slide. So we generated the question of what could we do with this space? And this is just a, a, word, a wordle of all the things that they came up with. So they created this vision. Um, next slide. So um, Steve, I don't know if you can click on that little piece. I don't know if you're, not, if you're in presentation mode. Um, no, that, that was a PDF, hold on a sec. Um, just pause. I know I'm short on time, so if it doesn't work, it's okay. Hold on a sec. Okay, this is very exciting. <laughs> so this little quick blurb. I actually have a longer presentation, but I saw the agenda and trimmed everything. This is a um, student, Aurelius Brockman, um, who is hopefully going to you are going to hear from about why this farming project is so important to the students. And Steve, if we have to go back, we can. Uh, let me just, uh, I just, you gave me access to it. So now I'm going to go to the video. I'm going to load that up in one second. Let's see. So while he's doing that, just so you know, um, Sarah Del Santo was amazing. She sat with us um, with my virtual club and worked with us on Screencastify and adding our videos to screens. And um, she did an amazing job helping me with technology with the kids, which was extremely hard considering I don't know all the middle school kids. Um, I think we got it, Ms. Brennan. Let me just uh, just make sure that the share is good. Okay. Do you see that? Yep. Okay. And volume up. Let me know if you can't hear it. Watch. Oh, oh, there he is. Yep. All right, Maggie. To have hand -like experience learning about sustainability, to avoid the depletion of natural resources, and to maintain an ecological balance in our community, to learn about local crops that best grow in the area, to learn about nutrition and provide healthy foods for the community, to learn about ecosystem. Yeah. And finally, to help protect the environment. Very good. So that was Mr. Brockman. He did a fantastic job. So from there, um, that was our vision. The kids really, I posed a question and they, every week we kind of researched answers and kind of came back together with our information and then built. While they were doing that, Sarah and I had a lot of meetings at the farm. Um, in the cold winter months of March. Next slide. We visited um, St. Joseph's Barrington Farm School and got a lot of great information on how they work their program. Next slide. We went to the Compass School and really delved in and just to mention their science scores are through the roof. <laughs> I know they're a smaller school, but they use the garden actually to do a lot of problem-based based learning. So our first phase, just so you know, um, we talked about soil testing, um, which we did. We are looking to um, in, uh, put trees and shrubs because there's a lot of wind in that area. We came up with a path for a, draw, a small driving cart. Um, we would like to get a 16 by 20 classroom shed that would look much like the farmer shed um, to hold our equipment and use it for wash stations and, and classrooms. 
Um, there's a higher ground there that we hope to use um, for leveling outdoor seating area for classroom um, classrooms and family seating. Um, we have a compost area that we created further down. We would like to do a pollinator trail, um, which will be created on the east side near the water. And sunflowers and pumpkin patches will also be created um, where there's arborvitaes currently. So that was what the kids came up with with phase one. Uh, so Sarah and I have been busy writing grants. Um, in this, you will all have access, I'm hoping, to this um, document. Um, if you click on, please don't, Steve, right now, but if you click on the blue link, it goes to the budget that the kids created. Um, it came up to about $66,000 to start, you know, it, we're on our big wish list. Um, but I did not receive a grant on dollars. Yes, we were very excited. Um, Eastern um, Division, Sarah Churgan's um, division was our sponsor. So it really is going to them, but it's going through to us directly. So we, we will. Margie, you're cutting in and out. Could you? Um, the next Thursday. You're, you hear me? In and out. Could you go back to the start of the discussion about the grant that you got? We, that's where I think we lost you. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Uh-huh. Okay. Um, we received $500 from the grassroots grant. It's a New England uh, program, and I will send the information in a bit. Um, it's, we're sponsored through Sarah Churgan's Eastern Rhode Island Conservation District. Um, so it's actually under her, um, her nonprofit, but the money goes to Portsmouth Middle School. So I wrote it and I had to go through several interviews and then I received the $500, which I've already spent. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we found a wonderful farmer in Tiverton who actually came over last week and he, um, next slide, Steve, he tilled three rows just for us to start. Because um, working with anything of NRCS or anything in the state, you actually have to have an existing farm. So on Father's Day, I reached out to the families and we had a wonderful seven families show up and we all raked and we planted corn, squash, pumpkins, dill, and um, tomatoes, things that were hardy that could be grown with minimal water because right now I'm working on a water source. So we are now up and officially running. Next slide. So with that, I just wanna tell you our future vision and this is from the students, from their mouths. Um, we are actually working with Clean Ocean Access to learn about co composting through their zero waste initiative program at Portsmouth Middle School. They are actually um, going to be working with Mr. Aruda and the lunch program, depending on how we go back. Um, we are gonna create a 4-H program to kind of do like a feeder program for the um, elementary schools so that both Melville and Hathaway have the opportunity to come out and learn, and I, I apologize, my dog, um, learn about the farm, and then this way when they get to the middle school, they'll be already engaged and have a little bit of an agriculture background. Um, we talked to St. Lucie's Hearth about donating a third of our harvest to their food pantry. Um, our farmer's market, the kids want to um, run a farmer's market for education and financial literacy and sustainability. So once we get the garden up and running, we, we know that we have to keep money coming in and it would be um, through that farmer's market. Uh, we also talked about uh, renting farming garden plots. So we have a layout and um, we are going to rent it to families so that we can teach families in the area how to build a sustainable garden that they can eat from, food to, was it farm to food to table? Um, I'm hoping that we can do some half day field trips for both elementary and middle school um, with integration in math and science. And I've already connected to um, the green team at the high school in hopes that we can work together and possibly even down the road. Mr. Amaral loves me, I know, 
by saying this, a potential CTE program in sustainable agriculture. Um, on that note, just so you know, a, a recent graduate, Eric Camara, is going to school for environmental science and we're going to hire him as a part-time uh, farmer to oversee the day-to-day -day operations. So he's actually going to be almost learning on the job. And Sarah Churgan hires environmental scientists to do exactly this, so it's very exciting. And um, we're hoping to, down the road, extend our education opportunities to both Middletown and Newport. And next slide is, thank you very much for listening to me. Wow, that's a lot. You have quite the vision. Yeah. <laughs> uh, very, very exciting. Are there any questions? Uh, I, I'm only seeing uh, a few members here. So oh, there we go. I'm back. We're back. Uh, Mr. Payero. Uh, Alan, you go first. All right. Oh, sorry, Alan. Okay. Uh, just a couple of, I don't know, I guess comments. Uh, so I take it there's no wetlands it's all a usable six six acres and just on your utilities uh with the sewage the electric and the water that uh if you're looking for a water source and you and you happen to go with a uh a well if there isn't public water that you might want to power it by solar and then that way the kids would learn a little bit how that's done that's how the ranches and for uh tanks for animals are are done that they're powered now by by solar and uh you're absolutely you're absolutely right on that and just to um interject on that comment um we actually that was one of our big research projects mm -hmm. and there is a water source i need to to get a backflow preventer so i had to buy it and on friday uh, the water company is going to turn it on for me um, and I have to buy 200 feet of hoses to water the garden until Sarah Churgan can get um, the NRCS who will um, actually help us with an irrigation system. So Alan, right there is where the kids have already been researching how solar power helps irrigation drip systems. Right. So we're, we're on that one. So I'm excited that you said that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Margie, this is absolutely amazing. So, but I do need to take you up on that offer to see. I'm actually, I, I know Martin very well and know the, the plants pretty well, but uh, so I would love to see where everything's situated. Liz, we're going to have to add this to the health and wellness policy now. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I would, but, absolutely. No, no, you would say yep, absolutely. You know, is, Email me and we'll set up a date to go down. I, I would, I would love to take you all down and show you the, the vision firsthand because it is pretty amazing. Yeah, no, I, I, I was talking about more like the nine to five hat, but it's, uh, the organization I work with, Martin is a participant in that organization. And so if there's anything, one of the, the areas we work in is environmental and blue tech, but if there's anything that you need in connecting resources, please feel free to reach out. I'll love to help out. Thank you. You know, I will. <laughs> um, the other thing I was thinking is that, you know how we try, uh, during the year to have uh, school committee meetings at the different uh, schools and locations. It would be really wonderful maybe to, to start with the middle school next year and, and start with like the tour of the farm early on to, uh, to see how you're doing there. So very, very exciting. But this is exactly, you know, this idea that, well, maybe education next fall is mainly outdoors, you know? I mean, wouldn't that be awesome for kids if they didn't have to sit down all day, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And Liz and I have already talked about, you know, using her outside space for, you know, getting the kids out of the classroom with remote learning. So that conversation has been full force. So I'm excited that you're on board with that. Exciting to have innovators and go-getters in the, in the district. Well done. Other Thank questions, you. comments? None. Uh, Mr. Aruda, we can need to um, unmute him, please. Ah, he didn't raise his hand. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I visually he did. I saw. Yeah, he visually, you caught him. And uh, there you hey, go. Man. Well, thank you. I just wanted to basically 
publicly thank Mrs. Marjorie Brennan for the work that she has done uh, with our students throughout this few months. It has been just a few months and the outcome has been tremendous so far. And this is again, one other outcome that we had with virtual in, uh, learning as we sat down to carry that club through, uh, through the school year. And it was a tremendous success. She had many, many meetings after school with the students and the, the enthusiasm was tremendous. And that was all virtual. So thank you, Mrs. Brandon, for, for doing that for Portsmouth Middle School and its community. Thank you. Does the, does the greenhouse still function at the middle school? Yes, it does. Oh, so now you have a greenhouse too, maybe, or something, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Well, thank you very, very much. I'm, I, that was a very exciting, um, very exciting uh, project. Okay, you, can I have a motion for discussion and approval of the Director of per Pupil Personnel Services contract, please? So moved. Second. All right, um, any discussion? All in favor, uh, roll call vote. Mr. Shears? Aye. Uh, Ms. McDade? You're oh. muted, sorry. Oh, oh, hold on. I can see her saying aye. <laughs> yep, sorry. Should sorry, aye. Okay, Mr. Vadney? Aye. Mr. Piero? Aye. Mr. Ferber? Aye. Lee Copeland, aye. Uh, unanimous six zero. Um, that we're good with that. We don't have to do any more. Dr. Kenworthy. No, it, uh, and this is just this is a contract renewal. Um, for you know, Dr. Colwell has has been an employee for a number of years. Our contract was just expiring, so this is a renewed contract. Thank you. Okay. Um, can I have a motion for discussion and action on the Melville Principal contract? No move. Second. Dr. Kenworthy. Thank you. Uh, so I am pleased to report uh, this evening uh, that we do have an announcement to make for a Melville principal selection. And you obviously have the contract uh, in front of you to approve this agenda item as well. I can tell you that, um, again, we went in to this, this process as a completely open process. Um, you know, we, we were not giving any, any uh, favoritism, so to speak, to internal candidates. There are over 40 applicants for this position, uh, Mrs. Viveros and Mrs. Little helped lead the uh, search committee for the initial phase. We had um, several uh, high quality finalists as we moved into that phase. And then uh, from there, uh, I did make a final decision uh, to offer this position to Mrs. Danielle Laurie, who uh, has been with the Portsmouth School District uh, for 16 years, 14 of those years have been at Melville in one capacity or another. Uh, Danielle uh, has, has uh, been a special education teacher in the district for a number of years. The past few years, she has served as student support specialist. Uh, she started out first for Melville um, and, and really did an outstanding role with that position. In the past few years, she's assumed that role, was able to work across both Melville and Hathaway. Um, and, and we're just very excited uh, to uh, be able to uh, bring her on as the next principal of Melville. I know she'll be able to continue a lot of the great work happening there, but also build upon it and uh, kind of put her own spin on things. So we're looking forward to that. So I am asking you to approve the contract uh, that I finalized within the parameters that you had set for me. All right. Uh, is there, before we vote, any discussion on that? Nope. No. No. Okay. Okay, so having a mo uh, first and a second. Um, sorry, Mr. Ferber? Aye. Mr. Shears? Aye. Mr. Piero? Aye. Ms. McDade? Aye. Mr. Vadney? Aye. Emily Copeland? Aye. Unanimous, <coughs> six zero. Um, whoop, I gotta get my little hand up applaud in here. Give it, there we go. I do see Danielle on here, so congratulations, Danielle. I don't know if we want to. Would you like to be unmuted so you can unmute see her here for a sec? Yep, she's unmuted. <laughs> well, good evening, school committee. I am so excited and happy and, and humbled and honored to just be selected as Melville's principal. Melville and this community mean everything to me. I promise I will hold up the shared leadership that has been 
modeled by Principal Viveris over the years, and I will lean on the many strengths of the talented faculty and staff that we have at Melville uh, to move us forward. From the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. I look forward to leading the school that I feel has truly led me. Thank you so much. I will not let you down. Congratulations, Danielle. Nice, very nice. We're very excited to have you. And, and I think it speaks well of the mentoring and leadership of uh, Principal Viveris that you help grow so many quali you could grow a qualified candidate. So nice job there too. Does Liz want to say anything? Yes, she does. Can we unmute her? Okay. <laughs> yeah. She was unmuted. There we go. Nope, still muted. Yep. There we go. All right, here. I, I tried to unmute Steve. I'm sorry, but once I mute myself, I can never get back in. Um, I just, I just want to take a second to just say that I am so proud of Danielle and all of her accomplishments. The past six years, I've watched her develop her leadership skills, take on so many leadership responsibilities within uh, our school and within our district, and to really become a leader that I wholeheartedly support in this position. I am I'm so happy for you, Danielle. So congratulations, and I look forward to our continued work together. Again, congratulations, and welcome aboard, and now plan for COVID. <laughs> Let's get to work. <laughs> the work begins tomorrow, Danielle. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, can I have a motion for discussion and action for salary increases for individual contracted employees, please? So moved. Second. All right, uh, Dr. Kenworthy. Thank you. Uh, so this is just one of the, the last items here. Again, our, our last meeting before the end of the school year. So over the past few meetings, we've been uh, finalizing contract renewals for uh, you know, current em employees with individual contracts that were expiring. We've obviously brought on a few uh, new employees as well that fall under that category. Uh, so this evening, what I have to present for for you for your approval. It's just the uh, annual salary determinations that, that you make on a typical basis for all other uh, individual contracted employees whose contracts are not expiring and are just carrying over into the next school year. So um, I know I presented some information to you. We had a discussion in the executive session and I'm just asking you to uh, approve those increases. All right, it's, it's, been a, it's been a tough year financially and I know um, Everybody's been working really, really, really hard. So uh, just wanted to say, I think we all really appreciate all the effort and going above and beyond and, and you know, keeping the district together. So um, I will be uh, voting in support. Uh, seeing no other comments, I'll call for the vote. Mr. Farber. Aye. Mr. Shears. Aye. Mr. Payero. Aye. Ms. McDade. Aye. Mr. Vadney. Oh. Is he on? It's not yeah. muted. Yes, he's on. Aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Emily Aye. Copeland, aye. Uh, unanimous uh, 6 0. May I have a motion for discussion and action on the NEA contract, please? I'll move. Second. All right. Dr. Kenworthy. Thank you, Dr. Copeland. So I am pleased to present uh, to you this evening. Uh, in agreed upon uh, contract renewal uh, that was voted upon last week by uh, NEA Portsmouth. As, as I think many people in the public know, we've been in uh, continued uh, contract discussions uh, for the past year. And uh, this contract will get us uh, through technically the current school year because uh, they had been operating under an expired contract and into next school year, uh, which will uh, provide us with with you know some a little bit of certainty there as we head into uh, all of the the reopening um, items that we've been talking about. So uh, again, I, I think I think all sides are very happy to uh, have a contract in place um, and and to bring us into the next school year. Hi, Mr. Shears. Yeah, I would like to thank uh, everybody for working together to put to put this through. I think this coming year is going to have uh, uh, so many challenges to it that I think that we go into the uh, next school year uh, united, working together, and uh, uh, as a team. And uh, so I'm very grateful that uh, everybody uh, came together to uh, uh, come to this uh, contract agreement. Thank you. 
Thank you. Anybody else? Um, I would just like to say that I too am very, very pleased that we will uh, hopefully approve tonight a two-year NEA contract for our teachers. Um, and I think all members of the negotiating group would agree that it's been a, a long and arduous process. Um, you know, it was made more difficult with the COVID pandemic and the resulting restrictions and financial uncertainty. However, I'd really like to thank all the members of the NEA negotiating team. I see uh, Carrie Jardine, president, is here tonight. Um, and uh, the negotiation subcommittee, uh, chaired by Mr. Vadney, um, as well as our administrative team and attorney Carroll for hanging in there, finding common ground, and getting this done. You know, our teachers have worked very hard over the past few months, um, rapidly modifying instruction and adapting to remote learning. Um, and I am pleased that we were able to, to provide a raise for this year. For next year, given COVID-19 and all the financial uncertainty swirling around the state, we are glad that Portsmouth can go forward without having to do damaging layoffs at this time. Education is a labor intensive business and not surprisingly personnel costs are the biggest part of our budget. And given the reductions to our operating budget, this agreement also helps us control next year's costs. While this is a very, very happy note on which to end uh, the school year, I, I hope that once everyone on the negotiating team catches their breath, uh, that we can start negotiations for the next um, three-year agreement and, and complete that in, in quick succession as well. So thank you all to all the members of the negotiating team. All right, calling for the vote. Mr. Ferber. Aye. Uh, Mr. Shears. Aye. Ms. McDade. Aye. Uh, Mr. Payero. Aye. Mr. Vadney. Aye. Emily Copeland. Aye. Unanimous 6 0. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so we'll, we'll work to get that sign there, Ms. Jardine. Uh, so I'll be in touch. Yep. <laughs> um, um, speaking of budget, can I have a motion for discussion and action on the updated FY21 operating budget? I'll move. Second. Dr. Kenworthy. Thank you. Uh, so you know, Mr. Dioro is, 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 is on for this one as well with me. Uh, but one of the things we wanted to do this evening um, be, before we wrap up for the... Uh, oh, Dr. Kenworthy, I'm sorry. I forgot. We need to do the financial impact statement from the NEA. Okay. Can uh, we go back? Yep. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Probably Mr. Mr. Diero for that, so we'll let him take that one. Sure. I forgot that. Uh, so you have in your backup, we're, we're required uh, for any collective bargaining agreement to provide a uh, financial impact statement to the school committee and the public. So um, I won't go through all the details, but uh, for FY1920, uh, the total incremental cost year over year was $381,961. Um, that does not include um, um, step movement for teachers, that's just raises. And then for FY 2021, uh, the total cost would be $198,600. Again, incremental year over year. Not including step. Correct. Thank you. Are there any questions on the financial impact? Nope. Okay. Sorry, I, I, I forgot that. I'm so excited. Yep, I did as well. Yep. <laughs> Go ahead, Dr. Kenworthy. Okay. Uh, so this agenda item addresses, uh, so in our operating budget, we've, we've been updating um, the, you know, the, the community um, the, the past few months through the discussions with the town council. We did see some reductions from the original budgets that we put forward, uh, both on the operating and on the capital side. Um, the capital, we've been kind of uh, working, um, you know, a, a little bit through our surplus, although we will, um, when we get back together again, um, you know, just kind of provide an update there. Uh, but we definitely wanted to, to before we closed out, um, you know, in addition to the school year closing out, the fiscal year is also closing out as of June 30th. So we just wanted to uh, really make sure that we could address uh, the changes that we had to make in the operating budget. So overall, uh, there was uh, most of the reductions that have come uh, on the town side came uh, in, in our capital budget, but there was uh, a total of 105 
thousand dollars worth of reductions in our operating budget. Um, I'll let Mr. Diorio kind of uh, fill in the details here, but I, I can report that again with the uh, uh, some assumptions that we were able to see in the contract that you just approved for uh, NEA Portsmouth, and also the, um, the the salary increases for individual contract employees, uh, administrators in the district, um, were actually less than what we had been anticipating in our projected budget. Um, so that made up uh, most of this. But Mr. Dioro, anything I'm forgetting? Uh, no, I think that that's it. In fact, in the budget that you have in your backup, if you were to go to page four and five, um, you would just see the uh, adjustments that were made to bring um, our budget in line with the budget that was passed by the town council, which we're required to do. Um, it, so we did reduce revenues and expenditures by $105,000. Total expenditures now are increasing by 2.4%. Uh, and our total revenues are 2.4%. And to support that, the town appropriation is now at a 3.2% increase. Um, we don't have that up. I mean, I have it up on my screen, but I don't think everybody else has that up on their screen, right? That's in, that would be in their backup. Okay. So any, um, any questions about that? I have a question. Yes, Dr. Uh, Tom, Tom Badney. Um, now, about a month ago, there was some discussion that we may have a reduction or state aid due to the tight state budget. Have you had any news on that? Yes, so uh, I think Dr. Kenworthy might have briefly touched on this earlier. So yes, um, there, there was a cut in state aid for FY20, the current year we're in, which is being backfilled with some CARES money. As far as next year, I believe they're taking it month by month um, and seeing what's going to come down from the federal government. So uh, I haven't heard of anything, but they, I think they are telling us to make sure that we plan for reductions because they're very likely. I can't see everybody. So speak up committee members if there's a comment. Yeah, no, I, I, I just would point out again, I know we've been harping on this, but you know, part of the reason our, our town appropriation is higher than our than our um, expenditures is because of this $210,000 uh, cut in state aid. And hopefully this is the last year of cuts to the funding formula. So um, if, we, if the town didn't have to help make that up, I mean, it would be a 2.5 increase in a town appropriation as opposed to that 3.2. So that makes a, that makes a huge, huge difference there. Um, okay, so that's the revenue. Anything else? Did you want to add anything else on that? Are we good? I'm good. Unless there's any questions. No questions. And opening up here. No questions. Okay, so we have a uh, motion and a second on the floor to approve uh, the updated FY21 operating budget. Um, calling for the vote. Mr. Vadney? Aye. Uh, Mr. Shears? Aye. Ms. McDade? Aye. Mr. Piero? Aye. Mr. Farber? Aye. Emily Copeland? Aye. Uh, unanimous 6-0. Uh, yes. Okay, can I have a motion for discussion and action on the revised 2020-2021 school calendar, please? So moved. Second. Dr. Kenworthy? Hey, Dr. Koblenz, so I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to present this to you this evening because this lets us check the first item officially off of our uh, reopening plan uh, documentation that we're going to have to provide. So, uh, as you know, uh, the last few months of distance learning throughout the past school year, uh, one of the things that was done at the state level was the decision to, to go to a statewide calendar and you know, something we've been talking about in the state for a number of years. and. Um, Again, made, made a lot of sense through what we were trying to do with the pandemic and distance learning. So um, the, Governor Raimondo got right out in, in front of this and by executive order um, a few weeks ago, right after our last uh, school committee meeting, announced that there would be a statewide calendar for next school year as well. So it technically supersedes uh, any calendars that are already in place and 
anything related to a collective bargaining agreement, but it's always good to be able to kind of work those things out, them fit uh, as, as much as possible for our, our district. And, and as part of that, I wanted to be able to present this to you uh, this evening. So uh, the, the core of what you see here, the 180 uh, school days that will start on August 31st and end on June 16th, would align with the statewide calendar. Um, wasn't a, a lot different from the calendar that we previously had in place as far as a start date for us. Uh, you know, we, we have uh, the, ex the little bit of an extended Thanksgiving break is part of the statewide calendar. Um, we are a district that had kept February break that there were some districts that had moved away from it. Um, so in this calendar keeps the February and the April break um, and uh, so not, not a lot different for us in that regard. What it does do is it adds uh, eight, what, what are gonna be considered professional development days in the heart of the calendar throughout the school year. And uh, one of the, the things we've already been asked to prepare for in our reopening plans is, uh, so we had some of those in, in the statewide calendars uh, for the end of, of, of this school year, but next, next year these will be uh, PD days for staff, but distance learning opportunities will be expected to be provided for students. So again, we can officially count them uh, as school days. Uh, so one of the, the last items that, that I wanted to be able to do before presenting this to you, I did have a conversation uh, with our, our NEA uh, Portsmouth uh, union leadership. And uh, so we have an additional three, well, it's really four days, right? We have an orientation day and then three uh, up to three professional development days uh, as part of the teacher's contract. Um, so in collaboration with uh, NEA Portsmouth, what, we've, what we're presenting to you this evening is that we would put two of those days prior to August 31st. So that would be uh, August 26th would be the orientation day for staff and August 27th would be a district professional development day. Um, so that'll provide us a couple of days up front uh, and we put the two remaining days, those are at the end of the calendar, June 17th and 18th, and I have them listed right now as flexible PD days. So the thinking being, um, there are certainly plenty of other days now built in uh, throughout the statewide calendar. So if we, if we get through the school year and decide that we don't need them, um, then again, I, I don't think anybody would complain about just officially ending the school year on June 16th. Uh, maybe something pops up that we need to do at, you know, right at the end of the school year. Again, we just have so many unknowns. The other um, kind of concern that I have that I wanted to prepare for is much like this year, if you remember, we had to implement our distance learning plan, you know, on, on a dime, if you will, on March 13th and just be prepared, uh, you know, to, to come back to school a week later. Uh, so again, I think, I think there is the potential for some uncertainty to crop up this school year with uh, you know, what they're, they're asking us to prepare for possible transitions in and out of school. So it'll be nice to have those flexible uh, hours if we need to uh, employ them. So uh, again, that's the calendar that I'm presenting to you this evening. Um, with your official approval, we will, uh, I will, this will be part of my, uh, my first uh, kind of reopening update that I'll do this week. And I'll just start making everybody aware of uh, these changes. And this will be part of our plan for reopening. Okay, um, can I ask two questions? Yep. So um, does that mean every single high school have graduation on the same day? No, um, hmm. no, it, it was listed uh, kind of funny if, if you're referring to when the guidance first came out on the calendar. It just means, and I think it actually matches up well for us. So June 4th was our original graduation date. I think that was the date, that, that's the 100 and you have to have seniors put in at least 170 school days. So whatever date that was in the guidance, it, it was just meant to imply that graduations could start taking place anytime after that. So I'm certainly hoping that not everyone uh, decides to graduate on the same day because I'll have yeah. a day that will be yeah, graduating. No, I think that might be yeah. hard for, for also staff who might have kids. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, Again, we kept our original graduation date of June 4th just because it, it fell within those 170 days. So hopefully it spread out a little bit in those last few weeks. 
Okay, and then my second question is, what was it? Oh yeah, so there will be, and we know this now, absolutely no snow days next year, regardless of right. what the what the weather does. Is that the idea? Correct. Um, yeah, and that's something we've been talking about in the state for a few years, but it looks like uh, it, it will be again one of those one of those positives that we can attribute to uh, the pandemic and distance learning. I mean, we, we've certainly proven that we have the capability now to employ distance learning when needed. I mean, already as part of our reopening plan, again, we're going to have to lay out the, those different scenarios from, from all the way from full in-person to full distance learning uh, and just be ready to you know, have students or staff move through those scenarios at any given moment. So certainly a snow day or something that would pop up like that would be one of the opportunities that we could we could put that into place. Okay. Um, so I think we've had, we didn't vote on this though, did we? No. Uh, yeah, I don't think. Okay, yeah. So um, seeing no further discussion, I don't think. No okay, comments right. in the chat. Um, I'll call for the vote. Mr. Shears? Aye. Ms. McDade? Aye. Mr. Ferber? Aye. Uh, Mr. Payero? Aye. Mr. Vadney? Aye. Emily Copeland? I keep you on your toes by mixing it up. Isn't that good? <laughs> uh, unanimous. 6-0. Six, six okay. Um, motion to discuss the graduation policy, please. So moved. Second. All right. Um, is this going to be Ms. McDade or Dr. Kenworthy? Uh, either or, I mean, if Ms. McDade's comfortable presenting, she was certainly part of the discussion, or I can fill in any, uh, anything. Why don't you talk a little bit, uh, Dr. Kenworthy, about yeah. the committee that- Bringing it forward, sure. Put this together. Yeah, this was, uh, uh, so, you know, what we did want to have a last policy, uh, subcommittee, um, last week, as Ms. McDade had indicated, uh, and, and this was the only item for discussion. Uh, this was uh, something that I had brought forward right about the time that I transitioned into the role of superintendent. I had been contacted a little bit prior, and then obviously there was just a lot happening um, throughout December and January with the transition. But um, a few years ago, we had updated our district graduation policy. Um, you know, at the time, we were thinking we were aligning with uh, basically ride guidance. There had been some changes to that guidance since then, and, and we just needed to go back and, and uh, update our, our policy to reflect that. So really, if you have that open from the backup, yeah. it implies with, um, and we did, so, so I asked uh, Mr. Amrill to, to get his, his school improvement team working on this, and I know uh, Mr. Zapala also kind of helped uh, lead those efforts from the district level. Um, so they, what they've requested to do um, is put these these changes in effect for the class of 2022 and beyond. Uh, that way, we kind of hold harmless. Uh, you know, next year seniors wouldn't have enough time to adjust to the updates in this policy. Uh, but the updates follow in in the, the next few paragraphs after that, uh, and it, they basically apply to the performance-based graduation requirements that we have to have in place. So. Uh, what's listed there is A, B, and C, either the completion of a career and tech program, and, and it, it, which would include an embedded capstone project, uh, a ride sanctioned, or some of our pathways that we're starting to, to grow, um, which would also include an embedded capstone project, or a, a senior exhibition, which you know currently the senior project would, would kind of fall in that category. So between all of those options, we would meet that performance-based graduation uh, requirement. Uh, and then we just took the opportunity to wordsmith. There were a couple of uh, uh, things that we included uh, in the, re the review and the policy subcommittee that we thought could have been uh, worded a little better. Ms. So. McDade, anything to add? Um, not really, just that um, we did have discussion early on about this. There were issues that were outstanding, and I think that the team that put this together did an excellent job of uh, addressing all the issues that there were. Great. Have you guys been sure to, or once we approve this, will this definitely be shared with Little Compton and the school committee and the superintendent? So absolutely. This is the second read, right? So we'll have to wait till the first meeting in August. We'll have it on for the final read, and then... Um, but I can, I can certainly share with them the, the draft as it will stand after tonight. Right. I, I, I hope that, um, I think for, uh, 
I don't know where the eighth grade students would be when this was announced because one of the biggest changes I see was that we, we were going to kind of ease out of the, the senior projects and yep. that's kind of eased back in. So I, I hope that that parents realize that because I, I mean, yeah. for a while it was, we weren't going to be doing senior projects anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, you know, we have a number of students participating in, in, in our C, either our CT programs or we're trying to, to grow. We have a couple right now and we're trying to grow our pathway programs as well. Uh, so to meet the requirements for those programs, there is a kind of an embedded project, very, very right. similar that would just align with the coursework that they're taking. So if a student is not in one of those programs, then yes, they would have to do uh, the exhibition piece, which would look more similar to a, the senior project. Any other, uh, there's no vote on this. This is all. Um, uh, uh, what do we usually do for second read? I'm trying to. Uh, you, can, you don't have it as uh, an action item. Done. Right. Okay. Oh, do yes. It's just, it's just on for discuss. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, all right. So, uh, what you'll be sharing that, I guess, I think it would make sense to share it now with the community and the, the families and and Little Compton, just to make sure if anybody had comments, they could get us back for the next policy read, which would be our final read, right? Sure, mm -hmm. I can make sure it goes out uh, well in advance of that, yep. Or uh, Mr. I see Mr. Amaral's on, he, he may have already sent out an email about it or something, I, I don't know. Did you? I unmuted him. Oh, he's muted. He's, <laughs> I unmuted, I unmuted him, yeah. We had, uh, we had this discussion back when we had the subcommittee on, on, uh, from the school improvement team. So those minutes went out to all the families. Oh, good. Uh, so it was mentioned on there in terms of the change in the proposal that we're moving forward. Uh, how much the students and families paid attention to this during uh, COVID experience, I don't know. Uh, uh, I didn't get any uh, objections to it. I think certainly next year, here, as you know, is a by year. Those seniors, we have about 25 seniors that are requiring to take senior project next year, and we're working with them to be able to find a project that suits their needs. Um, and uh, going forward, I think this is a great way to stay within the spirit of, of a capstone or an exhibition or a senior project for students to bring all their learning together and to manifest that as part of their senior experience. One of, the, one of the recommendations that we're making to the steering, uh, the steering committee, if this policy is approved, is to uh, start the uh, project earlier in their junior year, because we find that it gets really log jam when their presentations are due in May. Uh, there's uh, AP testing that happens in May. Uh, there's uh, college declarations in May, and they're finishing up their year uh, to be uh, finished for graduation in the first week of June. So we're trying to see if we can get it and move the timeline a little earlier so that by February vacation of two years from now, most seniors will be completed with their uh, exhibition or their pathway. And we're continuing to, uh, believe me, when I tell you we're exploring many pathways in every single discipline area that are gonna, go, that are gonna create more in-depth knowledge in, in, in an embedded exhibition to provide students with the uh, in-depth knowledge that they need to be successful uh, learners uh, for the 21st century. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, I've been talking uh, just this last two days with our department heads individually and trying to uh, uh, germinate some ideas that are going uh, opportunities for um, more pathways, which would then become, would become their exhibition. Mm -hmm. I, I just think back to the time when my kids were in high school. I think there would be a lot of excitement from being able to do this junior year versus senior year. I, I have a feeling that's going to be a very popular option. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think so. Too. I think most kids already do early. Many kids do early start. But I think if we can start it earlier, it takes some of that pressure off the kids. Uh, and it gives them a real chance to get deep into a particular subject or field and really do a good job and learn a lot more. Okay, not yeah, thank, so thank you to everyone who, who contributed to the updates. Thank you. Okay, I think that is uh, the, the last item on our agenda. We will be recessing uh, into executive session. 
We will not be having a formal school committee meeting in July. Now by August, are we able to meet in person? Have they opened up at that point? No, I, we don't know yet, um, yeah. Dr. Copeland, because the governor keeps extending it every 30 days. So we may, it's gonna depend on what the governor does. Okay, but yeah. hopefully we'll be in August, uh, maybe back, uh, back in person um, over at town hall, but you'll have to stay tuned. They've extended the Zoom meetings, right? Yes. Okay, so one way or the other, we will be having our meeting on August 11th and August 25th. So we wish you all a, a very uh, good summer break, unless you're working on the reopening plan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, with that, can I have a motion please for uh, return, what's it called? Recessing Recess, to a, Recess into executive, Recess to executive session. session. Go ahead, Fred, make the motion. I'll make a motion that we uh, uh, recess into executive session. Second. All right, um, Mr. Shears? Aye. Ms. Ferber? Aye. Mr. Vadney? Aye. Uh, Ms. McDade? Aye. I don't see, oh, there's Mr. Prayero. Mr. Prayero? Aye. Emily Copeland? Aye. Okay, we are now officially recessed into executive session. Thank you everybody for coming. Congratulations, Danielle. Bye. <laughs>